So here we are, almost at the end of looking at the importance of other fronts in the war. And this is part four, what was the impact of the war on civilian populations. World War I was the first total war. And this means that the entire population, civilians included, will be affected by the war and in different ways. So if you look at this image here, you have an older woman who's waiting in line for food and collapses. And so this was something that happened in a number of different countries. Pretty much every country saw an expansion of government control over the people. They all created new government ministries to help direct resources. World War I was the first total war and the first truly industrial war, which means that all of the country's resources, including financial, educational, agricultural, cultural, hu and human, are going to be geared towards fighting the war. That means that the government has to be able to expand its control to harness the industrial capability of the country in order to meet the needs of war. They also have to be able to direct the human resources to put them where they're best needed, which also involves censoring information. And therefore, this whole part is going to be known as, a, as the home front, as in another place that the war is being fought. And the home front was just as important to the outcomes of the war as were the fighting fronts. The home front fed, clothed, and armed the tens of millions who fought in the war. It also meant that the home front was part of the war effort then they, it could become a military target. And for some countries, the impact on the home front was too much. The sh people also faced massive deprivations in food, in um, resources, and the sheer scale of the war m with the numbers of people fighting, the casualties, the economic hardships meant that this war affected people on a scale unseen before. And in every country, women entered the workforce to help the keep the economy functioning and to produce the materials needed to fight the war. With the exception of Russia with the February and October revolutions and the Arab revolt in the Ottoman Empire, combatant countries faced very little anti-war unrest. This was because of the massive use of propaganda to rally the morale of the population. And while propaganda was useful, so was censorship. People did not have much knowledge of conditions on the fighting fronts. Soldiers' letters were read and censored, as were newspapers. In most countries, the concept of conscientious objectors didn't exist, and people faced persecution from the state and fellow citizens for not wanting to take part in the war. As part of the home front, and therefore instrumental in the outcome of the war, the civilian population was not exempt from direct military action. So here you have a chart showing the numbers of civilian dead. And this excludes famine and disease, which is going to severely ratchet up the numbers. So this is basically direct death as a result of the war. So that gave us a general overview of what was happening uh, in the combatant countries. Let's zoom in, zoom in a little bit and look at. Britain introduced the Defense of the Realm Act in August 1914. The idea here was that the war effort was way too vital to be left to the free market, and therefore it needed to be coordinated, directed by the government. This gave the government broad powers to secure public safety, which meant that the government had sweeping powers, and this allowed for censorship of media, imprisoning people without trial, reducing the hours that pubs could be open. They introduced something called um, British Summertime, which changed the clocks to re increase the number of work hours with sunlight, and this helped to increase productivity. Now, for the first two years of the war, Britain fought with a volunteer army. But in January 1916, they introduced conscription. The combined losses at Mons, Ypres, Gallipoli meant that the volunteer army that they started out with, that is three million men, had been greatly reduced and they needed to keep the army stocked with men. And so initially, they started with single men between the ages 18 and 41 in January. And that was not enough because by the time we got to May, they changed it to all men. Now think about the impact that this is going to have. That means if you were married, if you were the oldest son, it didn't matter. And if you went, by the time you get to the age of 41, it was likely that you had a family and the potential impact that is going to have after the war.
Conscientious objectors, those who refused to go to war based on their conscience or religion, were jailed or forced to join military units. Some people, to avoid this, joined non-fighting um, aspects of the military. Now, this conscription was devastating to local communities because one of the things that the government did was that they encouraged people from the same towns to sign up together, which, and, and they were put in the same units, as in this idea of being with your friends would help keep up morale and you'd want to work harder as a soldier. But the problem was is that when these units would suffer heavy casualties, that meant that it was hitting the same location, right? So these local communities, these towns would be losing large portions of their population. Britain was also vulnerable to blockade since she imported about 60% of her food. And so you have these food shortages because men were joining the military and therefore not there on the farms. And then of course, as we spoke about in the um, War at Sea video, you have German unrestricted submarine warfare targeting um, boats importing materials. And so the government um, attempted to deal with this in a number of ways. So they increased the area of farmland to be able to produce more food domestically. They increased food imports from the US. In January 1918, they started um, rationing and people were convicted and jailed for violating um, rationing limits or for buying and selling goods on the black market. They also introduced the convoy system, as again spoken about in the War at Sea video, to help reduce the vulnerability of ships to German submarines. The other thing is that Germans used their Zeppelins and then later bomber uh, planes to bomb cities. And so the total was about 5,000 casualties for Britain. And if you look here, you can see um, the names of people and the fines uh, that were given to people for violating ration. Women became an important part of the workforce in Britain. In 1914, they were only about 24% of the working population. And in 1918, it had increased to 37%. So they're working in the jobs that um, were in the munitions factories, making guns, making bullets, everything. There was also something called the Women's Land Army. And the purpose of this was essentially to have women take over the jobs in agriculture to keep food production up while men were off fighting the war. Also, women were in uniform in later stages of the war. They joined the Army and the Navy as non-combatants, um, taking over clerical roles and support staff in the armed forces. So looking at this, you can see munitions production um, in the years 1914, 1918. This was largely done by women. And then also you have the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. This uh, was begun in 1917, and women were sent to the battlefields as cooks, nurses, and doctors. And over 57,000 women served. So let's take a look at the civilians in the US. Now, despite joining the war late, the U.S. passed a number of laws to reduce the threat to the war effort. The Espionage Act of 1917 said it was illegal to interfere with soldier recruitment or pass along classified information. Also, you could not be a conscientious objector, though some people still could object for religious reasons. They developed something called the War Ministries Board to coordinate production and the accessing of resources needed for war. The, in 1918, the Sedition Act made it illegal to badmouth the Constitution, the government, or the military. Now, just as in other countries, women did enter the workforce, that is taking over jobs in munitions, um, driving trucks, whatever that was needed once men went to war. The U.S. did not experience the food shortages given that the war was not fought on American soil. Actually, she was able to produce enough food for her population as well as supplying the Allies. Now, in the case of Germany, things were a bit different. 
Now, Germany was actually able to produce domestically the high level of steel and coal needed, and she was able to feed the army. But all of this was at the expense of consumer goods and food for civilians. So people were not able to meet their needs, nor were they able to have enough food to eat. So there were a huge amount of food shortages because of the British blockade. So Germany needed to import food, but as the British were blockading them, they were unable to do so. It is estimated that about 800,000 people died of malnourishment and related illnesses. Now, food was a big issue for the civilian population, and the government did try to address this. So they did things like substitute goods, um, like instead of coffee, they would roast acorns or beech nuts and make coffee out of that. When the potato crop failed, people ate turnips instead, even though that was traditionally a food for animals. There was the movement towards summertime. Essentially what this is, is that they moved the clocks forward by one hour. And what it did was allow people with an additional hour of daylight so that after work, they had the joy of going home and working in their food gardens. That's right, step right up. Summertime is great. You know what, you finish working a full day, then you get home, work some more. And so this also tells you that one of the things that people were doing in order to deal with the food issues was planting their own gardens at home. Millions of pigs were slaughtered, and this, of course, allowed for, well, people to eat them. Um, but really, what it did was save on grain, because instead of feeding the grain to the pigs, then it could be saved for human consumption. Rationing was introduced in Germany, though, in 1914. That is, almost as soon as the war broke out, rationing in um, food goods was introduced in order to allow for feeding the army. And the Spanish flu outbreak in the winter of 1918 was widespread to every country around the world and amongst soldiers. But in Germany, because of, of the malnourishment of the people and the poor conditions domestically, that meant that a large number of deaths. Now for women, a huge portion of the population did enter the workforce because 18% of the population was actually in the military. And so women had to come in and fill those roles. Food shortages and flu led to a rapid increase in death rates for women in 1917 and 1918. Now let's talk a bit about Russia. So it might be really good to kind of review the notes from the previous video about why Russia left the war in 1918. As we've spoken about, Russia's trade was decimated after the closing of the Turkish Straits by the Ottomans. Now with the largest population in Europe, that is almost double that of Germany, manpower wasn't the issue for Russia that it was in other countries, but, they were broke as a joke and they had no money. So funding the war was problematic. Hence, as you can see on the right there, this poster attempting to sell patriotic and profitable war bonds. But to be fair, every country sold war bonds to raise cash in order to pay for the war. Russia also had food shortages. And we spoke about this again in the um, video on why Russia left the war. And this is because of the poor rail network, which meant that food couldn't be distributed to the towns and cities and keep up with the demands of supplying the needs on the front. Peasant farmers had no incentive to sell what they produce since there were no consumer goods for them to buy and there was no need for cash. So they stored it, they hoarded it. And of course, there was also inflation created by the government printing money to pay for war, which means that the real value of the money decreased while prices increased. So between 1914 and 1916, the cost of meat increased by 232% and the average price of food by 90%. Millions of people were made refugees during the war as the Russian army retreated and the German army advanced, as well as after the loss of lands as a result of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. So kind of think about the impact that this has on the remaining populations, as well as the refugee population themselves. 
Now, we have the economic conditions leading to political revolutions in February, where they overthrew the monarchy, and the second revolution in October, where they overthrew the government that overthrew the monarchy. Right? Now, women became 43% of the industrial workforce. I think this is the highest of all of the combatant countries. And they worked in the factories to, pro um, to provide domestic and war goods. And there was a female fighting battalion created in 1917. You have a female fighting battalion created in 1917. Russia was the only country to place women on the front lines. The provisional government did so as a sort of propaganda tool to help inspire the men to fight. It's like, look, if them ladies can get out there and fight, why aren't you fighting so hard? And so these battalions were, cre were made up of volunteers and about 5,000 women served. Now, in France, again, some of the similar things, but a bit different. For example, as you can see here, about 10% of French land was occupied by the Germans, and so there are going to be problems for people as they live under occupation. Now, the rest of France didn't face food shortages because so much of France was agricultural, still to this day, so they had a huge amount of land that was unaffected by, to the, by the war, so they were still basically self-sufficient in food. They, of course, have refugees from those areas that are occupied by the Germans, and that places additional pressure, not to mention the you know, psychological um, impact on people as they're forced to flee their home. Now, in France, about 20% of the population was in the military, and therefore those roles had to be filled by women. So about 33% of the people working in the arms industry were women. So that's right, they're up there making guns, making bullets, making tanks, everything. Now, a lot also worked in the countryside, taking over for farm labor for husbands um, and fathers, et cetera, fighting on the front. And there was some benefit to them because the government did increase farm incomes um, and allowances to soldiers' wives. Woo! We've reached the end, sort of. Uh, we've looked at um, some of the major combatants and the issues that the home front uh, faced. But there is a however. Uh, in the case of women, the numbers are somewhat deceiving. Only about one million women joined the workforce. That is, the vast majority of women who were working in munitions, uh, who had shifted into these new, these new industries, who had these new roles, were women who had already been in the workforce. They had low paying domestic jobs and this offered them an opportunity to move into better paying ones. Now, after World War I, there was massive public pressure in all countries for women to resume their traditional roles, which meant that after the war, women could not maintain the economic gains that they had made during the war. Jobs were wanted for returning soldiers, and the majority of women went back to the domestic sphere. Now, in many European countries, there was some progress. Women gained the right to vote. They received the right to vote in Austria in 1919, Belgium partially in 1921, Czechoslovakia in 1918, Denmark 1915, Germany 1919, Netherlands 1919, Poland 1918, the US in 1920, and last but not least, Britain took their own time getting around to it. Women gained the right to vote in Britain in 1928. And just a side note about the Spanish flu. One of the things is that every country around the world, as far out to those islands in the Pacific, were affected by the Spanish flu. It was called the Spanish flu because Spain was the only European country without censorship during the war. Also, the Americans had censorship. And so in the newspapers, they were free to report about people getting sick. And even the king got the flu. So people came to associate the Spanish flu only with Spain. It caused between 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide. So remember how we said that X number of people in Germany, about 800,000 people in Germany, died as a result of malnutrition. 
well, then we have the numbers that increase as a result of this illness. This was especially bad in military camps because of the cramped and unhygienic conditions. People were, um, especially in those trenches, people were often wet. Um, they, it was easy for them to get sick. People were sitting very close together. And it was also problematic in countries like Germany where you had food shortages and people's immune systems were compromised. Woo, we are almost done. Wipe the sweat from your brow. But first, before you go, some red questions to answer. Consider, what is total war? In what ways could World War I be an example of total war? Consider the info from the rest of our studies, not just this video. So Great Britain relied on imports to a much greater extent than Germany did during the war. Why was the impact of food shortages much greater in Germany? How did the war have a positive impact on civilian populations? And Michelle out.